Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the Pan Future Society podcast. Today is Saturday, October 15th, 2016. It's a blustery day here in the Pacific Northwest, and I hope everything is well wherever you are. Uh, I guess I don't really have a ramble uh, to go on this week, uh, despite uh, the state of political things in the United States here. Uh, Let's just keep it about science today. All right, on to the news of the moment. Uh, first piece of news. Uh, what was that? Jeez, I'm 40, not 15. Oh, anyway, the first piece of news this week is a new study produced by researchers in the UK using Hubble's deep field images and data from other telescopes have concluded that there could be up to two trillion galaxies in the universe. Um, I, when I first read headlines for this, it was mind boggling and it still is, but, um, sadly with news headlines, there's often a slight catch. Uh, you may know if you're familiar with, uh, deep space astronomy, the farther out in space you look, the farther back in the past you are looking as well. So this study, what it concluded was that the universe may have had up to two trillion galaxies in the course of its entire history. Uh, led by Professor Christopher Consilis at the University of Nottingham in the UK, they combined images taken by the Hubble Space Telescope with other data to produce a 3D map of the universe. This allowed them to uh, test out some new mathematical models and infer the existence of galaxies which are not bright enough to be seen by our current instruments. Uh, This has also given them some insight into possible uh, evolution of galaxies uh, as to whether we have a top-down or bottom-up evolution of galaxies. Um, Their uh, study... Uh, Should the data prove uh, to be supported by some other observations and testing, um, would support the top-down approach, and that is that uh, the early universe was a massive collection of gas, and as the gases started to coalesce into galaxies uh, and separate and spin, and then those galaxies started to combine into other galaxies, basically started with a large... uh, spread out a bunch of stuff that gradually coalesced into uh, more of the galaxies that we see today. Uh, The uh, bottom-up model would have been that galaxies uh, were formed by smaller clumps, uh, like globular clusters, Um, but uh, this, uh, the top-down, would be that there was gases spread out everywhere very thickly, you know, very thick fog of gas, coalescing into galaxies and then sort of gradually reducing into fewer and fewer galaxies. So uh, this it is still exciting. It's still very cool to gain more insight into the evolution of galaxies. Um, there are not, they, they are not saying that there are two trillion galaxies now. Um, uh, I don't know if anybody is actually estimating how many galaxies there are now. Previous estimates of the number of galaxies in the universe was between 100 and 200 billion, which is a lot, uh, but this is larger by a factor of 10. So I don't know if you even can uh, decide how many galaxies there are right now. But given the length of time, um, depending on how far back these early galaxies formed, and how many stars appear to have planets around them, again, uh, adding more galaxies to the mix just increases the chances that there has been at least intelligent life elsewhere in the universe at some point. 
But uh, these early galaxies, again, the farther away you look, <laughs> the farther back in the past you look, the likelihood we'll ever uh, have any contact with anybody from uh, any galaxies other than our own, uh, let alone some of these ancient galaxies that are very far away. Uh, so far away they almost can't be seen, and in fact some of them can't be seen. Again, this study made some inferences with mathematical models uh, if they're out there, they may just be way too far away and way far back in the past uh, to see. I don't know, maybe that uh, that opening to Star Wars we all remember a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Um, and for a while I wondered, what, they have spaceships and stuff, how could it be a long time ago? The universe is very old and <laughs> very, very big. So uh, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away... With an advanced civilization, with uh, space-faring, uh, faster-than-light technology? Sure, entirely plausible. And, and now on to the second news item this week, something a little closer to home. Uh, a paralyzed man uh, takes the Portland Marathon on in an exoskeleton. Uh, Adam Gerlitzky made history Sunday... What was it? Last Sunday, I think. Um as the first paralyzed man to walk the Portland Marathon. Um, I don't know if this... I'm assuming he finished the whole thing. It doesn't say whether he walked the entire 26.2 miles, um, but he probably... I think he did. Um, he also, back in April, did a 10K. Uh, 11 years ago, he was a track and cross crunchy runner. He fell asleep at the wheel driving his car and crashed and severed his spinal cord. Um, and doctors and researchers uh, working on this exoskeleton selected him as a good candidate to test it out. And uh, it's really quite remarkable. He walks with uh, two crutches, and the exoskeleton uh, attaches to his legs and around his waist. Um, and it's just really cool. I the article, local news, is not very in-depth here, um, so I don't know if he had to change a battery or anything while he was uh, doing this, um, but if he didn't, that's that in and of itself is remarkable that the exoskeleton uh, was able to operate for that long of a period of time. Um, so here it is. It's, you know, it's here now. I remember seeing PBS Nova shows or something about... Uh, early work on exoskeletons and how it was almost ready and now it's here it's here so adam gorlitsky good on you man walking the portland marathon with his exoskeleton and that is your news of the moment this week's main segment, I want to get more into robotics. And just to be clear and not conflate this with AI, artificial intelligence, I am talking about machines that can perform tasks and interact with people in an autonomous or semi-autonomous way. And this doesn't necessarily require an AI, just some good programming. All of these machines are currently limited to a set group of actions. I'm also going to skip over the more industrial applications for the show. Uh, many people are familiar with the kind of robots you'd find in a factory or automotive plant. And I'm not going to get into robots that might be considered toys or devices to learn programming unless I've found some that are particularly interactive or assistive to people. A brief definition of a robot is also warranted. Uh, from Wikipedia, a robot is a mechanical or virtual artificial agent, usually an electromechanical machine that is guided by a computer program or electronic surgery, circuitry, and thus a type of an embedded system, blah, blah, blah. All right, so it's a machine, basically. Um, the, this definition includes virtual artificial agent, which I would think is sort of uh, software. I suppose software could be... A robot in its own way, but uh, uh, for our definitions, a, a physical machine in the real world is what we're concerned with today. 
The word was first used to denote a fictional humanoid in the 1920 play R.U.R. by the Czech writer Karol Čapek. Uh, apparently, uh, his brother Joseph uh, coined the word, but he was the first to use it uh, for uh, his purposes there. Um, it's also worth noting uh, in this origin of the word, the, the story R.U.R. Čapek wrote uh, as a play, offers a story in which humans and robots are in conflict. Uh, that disruptive notion has been there from the beginning, the idea that robots will take our jobs and that kind of thing. Um, since the very invention of the thing uh, being a robot, uh, and it can be seen as part of a, a sociological and psychological line going perhaps back to the original Luddites and the concern over textile machines in the early 19th century. However, humans are adaptable. Uh, George Robb, one of my favorite podcasters, has remarked uh, several times on a show recently how quickly we adjust to new things. Cutting down a tree from your front yard that's been there for 40 years is shocking at first, but it becomes normal very quickly. If you're old enough, you might remember the first time you encountered a self-checkout line at a store or the first time you swiped your credit card at a gas pump. Now it's more surprising to find a place without these things. Uh, the great uh, Douglas Adams gives us another perspective on these changes. Quote, I've come up with a set of rules that describe our reactions to technologies. One, anything that is in the world when you're born is normal and ordinary and is just a natural part of the way the world works. Two, anything that's invented between when you're 15 and 35 is new and exciting and revolutionary, and you can probably get a career in it. Three, anything invented after you're 35 is against the natural order of things. Well, thanks, Mr. Adams. Now that I'm 40, um, all you kids get off my lawn. Um, I do kind of think, th th for a lot of people now, uh, where we've gotten so wrapped up in technology in our lives everywhere, um, even if you're after 35, it doesn't necessarily strike some of us as against the natural order. At least if you're uh, someone like me doing this show, or if you're listening to this show, um, I guess if you think robots are abnormal, I don't know why you're listening. Um, but stick around, maybe I'll change your mind. So uh, the robots are here, and uh, if you haven't seen them already, they will be everywhere before you know it, and it will be completely normal. One robot that's been with us since 2002 is the Roomba, made by the iRobot company. It's become quite widespread, and I don't think people even think of it as unusual. It's just another appliance. iRobot also makes several other household bots, a mop version of the Roomba, a pool cleaner, and a robot that can sweep junk out of your gutters. Though their tasks are all fairly simple and direct, all of these devices have a certain about, uh, amount of autonomy and ability to adjust to changes in the environment and other challenges that might pop up, like avoiding people or not falling down the stairs. There are now several companies that sell robot vacuums and other household tools. A company called Kobe has just released a robot that can rake leaves and shovel snow, and there are several lawn mowing robots on the market. The hurdle for most of us who have seen one in action is the price. Uh, you can buy them on Amazon, uh, at least these lawn mowing robots, from a thousand dollars and up uh, to six or seven thousand dollars. Even the Roomba is several hundred dollars. Uh, Amazon, I did see, has a robot under $100 that will clean your grill. It looks like a little tiny Roomba with grill brushes. Uh, I might have to try one of those. Another area you'll, you'll find robots in use now is in tactical situations like police bomb squads. Many police departments use robots to examine potential bombs, enter buildings ahead of human officers, or in other dangerous situations, although I don't know how autonomous they are or if they're more like uh, remote-controlled devices. In fact, recently a robot was used to kill a man who had gone on a shooting rampage in Dallas. That is a situation I hope does not occur frequently, but it does reduce the danger to police. Believe it or not, you can buy these robots on Amazon and elsewhere. 
uh, at least the platforms of them, the wheels or treads that they roll on, and that serve as a base of the robot uh, to which I imagine you would attach other things too. In another security situation, you may have heard of the Nightscope K3 and K5 robots. They can be programmed to autonomous... To... <sighs> Why do I do the show so early in the morning? Maybe I, I need to. I need more coffee. More, more coffee. Where is my coffee bot? Anyway, Nightscope, K3, K5. They can be programmed to autonomously observe an area for suspicious behavior and alert human authorities when needed. They have cameras and other recording uh, systems to work with, and often the presence of such a thing is a deterrent. Their K5 model is 300 pounds and 5 feet tall and 3 feet wide, so it's a fairly imposing presence. You uh, may also have heard that one of these ran over a toddler at a mall, but it seems to be uh, likely also that the kid ran up to the robot and ran into it, uh, and the robot was unable to adjust to that situation. It needs a little tweak to its programming. Clearly the bot has more to learn about humans. Uh, Nightscope released their first version of the security bot in 2013, and these bots have been used for over 35,000 hours and have traveled 25,000 miles in their work. There are robots being used during natural disasters and other disasters. Drones are one common example. They can fly around in places people can't. Uh, in fact, I just saw a story about drones that found a man uh, who was having a heart attack. Uh, they can look for survivors and survey damage to an area. There have also been uh, robots similar to police robots used to make observation of areas. Uh, for example, after the Fukushima nuclear meltdown, they went into areas where humans could not. There are also a number of robots being developed for search and rescue operations with a variety wide variety of designs from human-like to snake-like, uh, although most of these are still in the R&D phase. Speaking of drones, Amazon is working to deliver packages by drone. UPS just tested a drone for delivery over open ocean as well. Their test simulated delivery of emergency medicine to a YMCA day camp on an island uh, off of the coast of Massachusetts, I think it was. Uh, drones offer such delivery options to hard-to-reach places both during disasters and under normal conditions. Domino's Pizza has tested drone delivery in New Zealand. A startup from the founders of Skype is testing a grocery delivery robot in Washington, D.C. It sort of looks like a cooler on wheels and can carry 40 pounds and drive up to two miles at this point. Uh, they went with wheels on the ground to avoid the regulations that drones are currently under. So keep your eyes peeled in the sky and on the ground you may see uh, some delivery bots out and about. Um, Self-driving cars are on the road now. I think they qualify as robots. It's a machine that makes decisions on its own. I suppose cars will, uh, will definitely get their own show down the road, but we will be seeing them as personal vehicles as well as long-haul delivery and taxi service. Uh, in the area of customer service, Lowe's Home Improvement uh, hardware store chain is now, or will soon be, testing a robot in an orchard supply hardware store in San Jose, California. It looks like a large white pedestal with a couple of uh, screens on it, and it can locate merchandise for you, and it will talk to customers in their own language. I'm assuming it speaks more than one language. The Yotel New York Hotel also has a robot that will store your luggage for you. Um, these are just a few of the many customer service robots I've read about, although these are ready for real-world use. Uh, the others I've seen can't be very far behind. But wait, you say, you've forgotten something, Sean. You've forgotten to talk about Japan. Well... I have not forgotten, and in fact, if you uh, know anything about robots, you would know that Japan has a lot of robots. 
Uh, they are far beyond anyone else in the world, in my opinion, in terms of having robots in their daily lives, uh, let alone participating in the development of new robots. So the robots of Japan will be a story uh, all their own, and I will do that for next week's show. And that is the show for this week. Uh, stay tuned for more robots next week. And thank you once again for joining me. Um, I'm very happy to bring this information to you. Um, and you may have seen it on Twitter. If you follow me on Twitter a week or two ago, I passed a thousand downloads of the show in, in total since beginning this at the very end of May. Um, in the scheme of uh, podcasters and the world of podcasting, that's probably not a lot. But it's a lot for me, and it's great uh, to see that for a brand new show. I think I hit a 1,000 by episode 19. And again, just thank you, thank you so much for that. Uh, come visit the show on the web at panfuture.org. Come find us on Facebook and Twitter. Email me, sean at panfuture.org. That's S-E-A-N at blah, blah, blah. Um, and everybody have a great week. I will talk to you again in the future. Yeah.